Hey guys, my name's Tisa and welcome to this week's No Now News. Okay, so for my headlines. Kurdish rebels announce withdrawal from Turkey. Human Rights Watch documents Rohingya persecution. France begins withdrawal in the north of Mali. Fitch trips Britain's AAA rating. Okay, so we start with Turkey and its Kurds. The Kurdish rebels, the PKK, have announced that they are withdrawing from Turkey starting on May 8th. And where is this all coming from? Basically, the PKK represent um, Kurds, rather people from Kurdistan, that are living in Turkey. And there's quite a large majority from them in the south of the country, but they've been oppressed. I mean, they're apparent, they have the feeling that they're not given the same rights as native Turks. And so the PKK was formed because initially they wanted to get their own state. They wanted to get an independent Kurdistan. Although of late they've kind of dropped their standards and now they just want some autonomy and maybe some more political and cultural rights. And so back in March, their leader, who's jailed, his name is Okalan, he announced a ceasefire, which kind of officially ended three decades of fighting and violence between the PKK and the Turkish government. And now, building up from this um, ceasefire, he's actually ordered his rebels to leave Turkey and go to their base in northern Iraq, which is kind of the unofficial South Kurdistan. And, I mean, for me, I think it, it reflects really well upon the Prime Minister of Turkey, first of all, uh, Mr. Erdogan, because there was some backlash against him for kind of granting rights to Kurds. There was some backlash against him because he continued talking with the PKK. But now it's kind of like he gets to prove his critics wrong because if this goes well, he has managed to get, you know, officially get rid of these people, the PKK, who are classed as a terrorist organization and in pretty much a safe way. Um, but, I mean, with the withdrawal, there's only been one kind of um, unmet condition, which is that the Turks wanted the, um, the PKK to lay down their arms and make the exodus, you know, bearing no arms. As the PKK, they've kind of said they're not going to do that. But they've expressed that they're not going to initiate any violence, and any violence will happen, to, will happen in retaliation for anything they incur along their journey. Um, also something that I think is really interesting is that there are talks that actually some Kurds would want to frustrate this because there are a lot of people who feel that it's a bit too early for the PKK to leave Turkey, like it's too early in the peace process for them to go and they're thinking well if they go and then the peace talks stall, what's going to happen to us? So that's another real issue. But in all fairness, I feel like even though there has been talks in the past, this time um, there's such a high chance of success because for once there's so much openness and there's so much transparency and um, Yeah, we're just hoping that we see a situation where the rebels they downplay their activity They kind of reduce on the so-called terrorism and you know, they're working from northern Iraq where they're gonna frustrate the Turkish government a lot less Okay, so on to the next one Human Rights Watch documents Rohingya persecution. Well, who are the Rohingya? Well, they're a group of Muslims and they mainly live in the Rakhine province in Myanmar or Burma, formerly known as Burma. Um, and a big issue is that they're not actually given citizenship by Myanmar's government. They're declared as illegal. Well, the ones that came after independence are declared as illegal. And they think that, well, the Myanmar government believes that the Rohingya, they're actually from neighboring Bangladesh. And neighboring Bangladesh doesn't want to claim ownership of them either. So it's kind of like they're stateless people living between Myanmar, where they're not really wanted, and Bangladesh, where they're not really wanted. And since last year, we've seen um, a lot of violence perpetrated against them. Satellites have shown that over 5,000 homes belonging to the Rohingya have been destroyed. Um, last year, in the retaliation for um, in retaliation for the murder of a Buddhist woman, there was just such widespread murder and rampaging and violence against these people. And the situation currently, it's really, really unfortunate. And this Human Rights Watch, they've documented that they believe there is ethnic cleansing going on. They believe that the Myanmar government is, system is systematically trying to get rid of um, this Rohingya population by denying them aid and by restricting their movement. And of course the government has denied this. 
but it just begs the question, I mean, denying this, it kind of implicates that you are aware that this situation is going on. And of course, like, it's not a known secret. These people that are working here, they are suffering there. And it just brings such an input in, it just brings a question, why is no one doing anything about this? Why is it on the hush-hush? And there are lots of reasons for this. I mean, for one, if Myanmar was going to call attention to the situation, it's going to kind of lose the credibility it's been building for itself um, since it's kind of dropped its military government, it's dropped its junta, and it's kind of open to democracy. And this opening up of democracy, it has allowed Myanmar to gain so many ties with so many countries against around the world. But if it sheds light on this and it kind of actually puts spotlight on the situation, it's going to alert more people and they're feeling that this kind of might slow down Myanmar's progress in attaining ties with the economic ties with the international community. And also another thing is that people are still too scared to talk. Um, you know, the junta, it's not in power anymore, but um, it's still a state where you kind of have to be careful what you have to say. Anyway, I just think it's so unfortunate and I feel like this case should be highlighted because we're living in a time where it's almost acceptable to be Islamophobic. Islamophobia, it's on the rise. But I feel like stories like this and situations like this show that, you know what, they are victims as well and it's just so wrong to generalize a group of people on one person's actions when so many of the same people are suffering elsewhere. So I just hope that the Rohingya in time they can find a place to call home and they can find a place where they are treated equally. Okay, so on to the next one. The French foreign minister has announced that his troops will be um, withdrawing from Mali where they've been fighting there against an insurgency by um, Al-Qaeda in North Africa. Uh, I mean, originally this would have been met with so much excitement because they have trained African troops to take over and it would have been nice just to see everybody get back to the state and start um, start kind of re-establishing life the way it was before this happened. But I honestly feel like considering that um, recently there were attacks on the French embassy in Libya, it would be very unwise of France to leave now considering that, you know, there are talks that um, the attacks in Libya are actually connected to what's going on in Mali and that um, it's Al-Qaeda's way of retaliating against the French for interve intervening in Mali. And so um, although Libya, although France wants to leave, um, although France wants to leave Mali, I feel that the situation in Libya is showing that its work in in North Africa is not done. I feel like it's highlighting the fact that its work in pushing insurgency and bringing stability um, into this part of the world, it's not done yet and leaving would be really premature. And it could have really unfortunate consequences, not just for the people of Mali, not just for the people of Libya, but for the French as well, because there are a lot of French nationals living in these countries. And I feel like the hostage situation highlights the fact that you know what, no one is safe. Anybody at any time could be taken a victim. And while I feel that they've done a really good job of supporting their former colony, which is Mali, um, it's not time to go yet. But, I mean, we're just gonna have to keep our fingers crossed and put some faith in the African troops that they will be able to maintain the situation should um, France really withdraw. Okay, so on to the last one. Fitch strips Britain's AAA plus AAA rating. So basically, Fitch it's um, a credit ratings agency, and they have stripped Britain's top rating, which is AAA to A plus, which is really still good. It's not a disaster, but it just signifies the fact that um, it feels like um, there is such a weak economic and fiscal outlook for Britain at the moment, and it hasn't done a good job of following its deficit plan. In fact, George Osborne actually admitted that they're years behind, they've been put a couple of years behind on fulfilling their deficit plan. I mean, it sounds quite menacing going, like being downgraded, and especially because this happened to Britain in February, another credit, aging, uh, credit ratings agency called um, Moody's actually downgraded, um, downgraded um, Britain's credit rating. But I mean, Considering that the same thing happened to America and France and it didn't really shake the markets, there was kind of like not too much of a great loss um, in market confidence from investors, uh, we're thinking that it 
will be kind of mirrored in England. We're thinking that it's not going to upset the markets in England and that people won't panic and it will be okay. But personally, I feel like it could, it could, it, it wouldn't hurt if things got shook up a bit, mainly because I feel it's time for the British government to realize it's not a crime to investigate options that are in austerity. I mean, they're holding on so much to this one method, this one mode of saving the economy. And even though they talk of stimulating economic growth, they don't talk about it nearly as much as austerity. And I feel like they need to see all of the tax cuts, all of the cuts they're making, and all of this budgeting and pinching, it's not really doing the greatest things for the economy in the way they thought it would be. So maybe now they'll open their eyes and, you know, try to look at other avenues. I mean, there are a lot of countries that are doing well while trying to push while trying to push economic growth. I mean, America is trying. Um, it's not as crazy, it's not as hardcore austerity as, as Britain is, and they're getting by, so hopefully they can take a leaf out of their book. Okay, so this brings me to the end of this week's um, No Now News, and I'd really like to hear your opinions, and please subscribe so you never go without your weekly summary. Okay, till next week. Bye!